Well, we're going to talk about palliative care for perioperative populations. Thank you for having me. It's really an honor to be here. I actually started on the road in September. We traveled cross country in a little Winnebago trailer for about five months to get here. We traveled 28,000 miles, and as you can imagine, going from Baltimore to um, California at 28,000 miles, we didn't go in a straight line at all. <laughs> so I actually only started here in March. Um, so I have no financial disclosures to make. I'm not going to reference anything crazy. The grant support, the award support for my research work is from these organizations in the past and present, and I'm very grateful for them. So kind of to get us started a little bit, kind of why do I do what I do? And what is the goal of my research? And I think this is kind of epitomized by an article that actually came out in the Wall Street Journal about six years ago. So the article was, the crushing cost of care, a small percentage of challenging cases, often at the end of life, make up the great bulk of Medicare spending on hospital care. Are we anywhere close to containing the costs? And I wasn't so much interested in the cost aspect of this article, but rather that the entire article really is about the story of this gentleman, Scott Crawford. This is how the article starts. On Valentine's Day in 2009, Scott Crawford, 41 years old, received the break that he thought would save his life. A surgeon at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore removed his ailing heart and put in a healthy one. The transplant was a success. But complications put the former tire warehouse worker in intensive care for almost a year. Surgeons removed his gallbladder, his left leg, and part of his lung, and Mr. Crawford soon became one of the most expensive Americans on Medicare. As his condition turned grave, one of his doctors questioned whether to keep treating him. Nurses reported feeling moral distress over his unrelenting pain. Still, medical opinion was split, and Mr. Crawford's family, with the backing of his transplant surgeon, pushed forward. A few days before Christmas 2009, Mr. Crawford died, leaving behind a young son. So he got his surgery in February. He was in the ICU for 10 months and a week and died just before Christmas. This is like an extreme case, but these are the folks I really care about. That 10% of our ICU patients who take up 40% of our resources, and I would hypothesize take up 80 to 90% of our mental bandwidth and our emotional bandwidth. Those folks that we keep trying to do right by, we bring our best game, but it just doesn't seem to fall, and, and they just can't seem to get out of the ICU. They can't seem to get out of the hospital. These are the folks I really care about. These are the folks that just drive me to get up in the morning. They wake me up in the middle of the night. My research work, and it's gone in lots of different directions, but when you scratch under the surface, it all comes back to these kind of folks. And I mean, this is an extreme case, but these are the folks that I really care about and that a lot of my research work has come out of trying to find out how to do better by them. When they do get into the ICU, this moral distress, like, you know, it rips you up inside. You're bringing your best game, and yet you can't seem to quite get around it. Um, so that, these are the folks that really drive me. And this case is in particular, is, to me, is important because I took care of Scott. My first uh, attending appointment at Johns Hopkins was exclusively in the cardiac surgical ICU. I started in September. He died in December. I took care of him many, many, many times. And that moral, and I was on service when he died. Um, that moral distress is real. It was so hard to care for him. He would do what we would call um, uh, crying without tears, where he would writhe in the bed because his symptom distress was so high. And I got to say, I just kept looking and thinking, we got to do better. There's got to be a way to do better for cases like this. And I mean, this is one case. I've taken care of a lot of folks and such, and this is an extreme case, but I think it drives home this point. I mean, do you guys know these kind of patients that I'm talking about? The ones that, yeah, you know, th those are my peeps. Those are the folks that really drive me in my work. So the key questions that are important to me really are how do we support patients and families in critical care units, the OR and beyond? And I gotta say, I've up to this point worked exclusively in surgical ICUs. So when I say critical care units, for me, it's surgical critical care units. All of my patients thus far have been surgical. Uh, and how do we effectively, feasibly, incentively work together to set and achieve meaningful care goals and to help surgical patients, families, and clinicians cope with long hospital courses? This is really my modus operandi. This is what my research work addresses and what I care deeply about. So the four areas of my research really are in improving delivery of palliative care specifically for certain populations in intensive care units, perioperative settings, actually in churches, which I'm not going to talk about today. It's um, taking palliative care language, advanced care planning, and using spirituality and infusing it with faith-based language to take it out of medical context and put it in the community. Um, and then palliative, I do a fair amount of outcomes and quality measure work, but today I'm really going to talk about my work in perioperative settings. So we'll first talk about palliative care and the evidence base around it, and then briefly review what's been done in the surgical world around palliative care, and then discuss my research work. So let's talk about the evidence base. So when you hear palliative care, what do you think of? So 
The Center to Advance Care Planning actually did a research study of this not that long ago, eight years or so, and when they asked doctors and nurses, this is the responses they got. Kind of game over, palliative care, it means the patient's dying or they're going to die, and something about letting go, this little frog letting go. You know, and palliative care providers, well, gosh, oh, look, the palliative care team is here to round in the ICU. I'm so glad they showed up. <laughs> Folks say, like, they think the, the, the gowns are hot in the OR, like, try a death shroud in the hospital. It's really hot. I try to leave it at home when I'm on pal care service. <laughs> but when they asked patients and families what they thought, they actually got really different answers. And this is what patients and families said. So 70% said, a palliative care, I, I don't know anything about it. 8% said, don't know. I'm not sure what the difference between not at all knowledgeable and don't know is. It sounds like they all don't know. 14% um, somewhat knowledgeable. Only 8% said they actually knew what palliative care was. And I got to say, that's been reflected in my own practice. So, you know, um, when I work as a palliative care clinician, I'll go in and say, you know, hi, I'm, I'm Dr. Oslikson. You know, Dr. Spain asked me to come see you. I'm from palliative care. Um, People hear palliative care, they think different things. You know, do you have any thoughts on that? And the vast majority of the time people go, I don't know what you are, which is great. That's a chance for me to explain. That's wonderful. You know, so when folks say, well, I don't want to get a palliative care consult for my patient because, you know, I don't want to give them that message. And it's like, well, you know, I know the message maybe you think that it is, but the message for patients and families usually is they don't know who we are. And maybe that'll change and such over time. I mean, the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine had a public relations campaign that came out of this. I don't know how much it changed things, but they had articles in magazines trying to explain what palliative care is. But most patients and families still don't know who we are. So what is palliative care? So the Center to Advance Palliative Care kind of has the definition that we all rally around, and that's palliative care is specialized medical care. So it's a protocolized, more routine approach for particularly for patients with serious illness and their family members. You know, you bang your knee, you need a knee arthroscopy, probably not great to call us. You got pancreatic cancer, you're going for a Whipple, you got metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, you know, we might be good people to call. Because our goal is to improve quality of life. That's really the underlying thing. Whatever else is going on, how do we optimize people's quality of life? And it's really appropriate at any stay, age and at any stage of serious illness, and it can be provided together with concurrent care. So it's not either or, it's actually an extra layer of support. You say, well, what is it? What are you actually doing? Well, the National Quality Program for our National Consensus Project for Quality Palliative Care said, you know, this is what palliative care, eight domains, things like physical symptom management, psychological symptom management, social support, uh, culturally appropriate care, care at the end of life. We do care for some patients who are dying, you know. I'm going to talk a little bit about how what we're doing is different from, say, hospice and such, but, you know, that's one of the eight domains, you know, ethical and legal issues and such. You know, that, that's kind of a lot, you know. So when folks say, Rebecca, what's palliative care? This is what I think it boils down to. So it's aggressive symptom management, psychosocial support of the family, and expert and compassionate communication, all in service to better supporting the patient and family. So aggressive symptom management, every time you see the patient, pain, nausea, anorexia, fatigue, depression, anxiety, constipation, diarrhea, we're always asking about that. And studies show that when we ask about it and we address it, they actually get better again and again. Psychosocial support of the family. When patients get sick, families get sick. Do right by the patient, you got to do right by their family. So we spend a lot of time with families. I always say if the patient's kind of the top of the pyramid, the family are those stones that are right underneath them and you can't really support that patient without supporting that family. And then expert and compassionate communication. Really it's getting to the idea when you're sick, your energy is low. So let's talk about what's important to you so that you can be mindful of how you spend that energy so that today can be the best day that it can be given the circumstances. So helping people talk through what makes a good day. What do you want to do today? Your energy is low so what things will give you the best bang for your buck for making today be as good as it can be. And putting it all together, that's palliative care. So these three things are how I really think about it, conceptualize it. We're conflated with hospice all the time, which is not surprising, actually. This philosophy came out of hospice. So hospice really, in its modern incarnation, came around in the late 1960s, came really out of the work of Dame Cecily Saunders in the UK, brought to the US by Florence Wald and um, Balfour Mont. Uh, in the 1970s. First hospices in the U.S. came around in the 19, early 1970s and then they exploded in number in the early 1980s when the Medicare benefit for hospice came around. Palliative care, so hospice really is about improving quality of life when people are dying. 
palliative care folks said, gosh, you know, that philosophy is really cool. But how about if we took it out, not just when patients are dying, but when they're sick and they're suffering? And you know, when you're having a huge surgery, it doesn't feel good. When you're having a bone marrow transplant, you feel lousy. So how can we optimize quality of life when you're seriously ill? So differences between pal care and hospice, and I'm not denigrating hospice at all. I think hospice is amazing. You know, if people are dying, yet again, study after study shows quality of life is improved if people die in hospice. So no, no bad mouth hospice, but it's different than pal care. So pal care is really based on need. People who need improved quality of life due to the um, symptomatology, both psychological and physical and social and spiritual that it comes along with serious illness. Hospice is based on prognosis. You can't go on unless the hospice you have is using one of the Medicare waivers, which is only a small subset. You have to have a prognosis of six months or less determined by two clinicians to be able to go on hospice. So it's really for people who are dying. Um, palliative care can be provided together with life uh, restorative care, with curative care. Hospice really is an exchange for it, because with hospice it's saying, you know, I'm not trying to live longer, I'm just trying to make the quality of life as good as it can be for whatever time I have left. And yet again, palliative care can be provided in concert with other teams. It's actually often provided by other teams, which I'll talk about in a slide or two. While in hospice, the care is really assumed by the hospice team, the hospice nurse, the hospice physician, the hospice volunteers, and um, health care aides. So is that clear? If I do nothing other than you understand that palliative care is different than hospice, my, my work here is done? Okay, good. And this is also conflated a lot, and I really don't know, because end of life care to me is a term that only really makes sense in retrospect. Because you know, are you practicing end of life care if you don't think the patient is dying? I mean, I've done critical care long enough where I've had patients who, whoo, they died. I didn't think they were dying. I guess I just was providing end of life care the last three weeks. You know? We're not that good prospectively of saying this person is going to die, this person is going to live. Like we can do scores and such, but that one person in front of you, our best prognostic models are like 70%. It's helpful in retrospect, the people who die look different than those who live in the ICU, but prospectively, it's really hard. You know, and if you can't say who's going to die, how, you know, you really have to bring it to the game for everybody. So end of life care is a term to me, it's not that helpful because it's really only useful in retrospect. And by the time we all agree that somebody is dying, we've missed a window to actually improve their life for the days to weeks that were prior to that moment. So who can do palliative care? So specialist palliative care is people like, like me who are boarded in pal care, and I always think of it as those eight domains, we're bringing our game on all eight. It's, we're specialists, we're supposed to be addressing all eight, folks who've done specialty training. But the vast majority of palliative care is primary palliative care. It's provided by frontline providers, primary care docs, oncologists, surgeons, um, ICU clinicians, cardiologists, end-stage renal disease, um, nephrologists, you know, folks who are taking care of folks with serious illness. We do a lot of it. You know, every time I'm in the ICU and I go to the family and say, how are you doing? is really hard. I'm providing palliative care. So, and I'm, maybe we can have a whole other conversation, but it's not just me. A lot of us in pal care, we have a huge workforce shortage in specialty pal care. You know, we're great, but the vast majority of the work needs to be primary palliative care. A lot of the future, I think, is going to be figuring out structures and ways to improve the primary palliative care that teams are already providing as a natural part of what they do. How do we enhance that so that they're more effective at that? So, Pal care can be provided by either or, and I mean, I think the future is mixed. The future is good primary pal care, doing the structures that enable that, and then having specialty pal care as a breakthrough for folks whose symptomatology or their social circumstances are kind of out of the norm and need specialist level care. So when to do it? Well, this is what folks thought first, you know, go, 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 oh, you're gonna die, okay turn it around. You know, I already said we're pretty bad at saying who's going to die, so that's not that good because we're, we're missing the opportunity to be able to improve quality of life for folks before everybody agrees they're going to die. So folks said, well, how about this? How about this? You know, we'll do some, some curative and then a little bit of pal care and then we'll kind of balance it out. You know, that's not good because that assumes a net sum zero. Somehow in the ICU when I'm doing pal care, it's detracting from my curative and restorative care. Like, that's not the case. 
So this is really the, the conceptual model that folks have rallied around. This is from the American Thoracic Society who were on board with this like 11 years ago, way before a lot of other folks. And it's this idea of concurrent curative, restorative care and palliative care going up and down based on the needs of the patient and family, based on their medical illness as well as their goals, because their goals can change. And then ideally, if you do think this patient is going to die, get hospice involved. And if you get hospice involved for no other reason, do it for this. Patient dies, hospice, to be a hospice. They have to provide bereavement care to the family. They have to. They can't get paid if they don't. So if you do it for no other reason, do it for the family who will get care in hospice for months to a year afterwards. So ideally, this is what we should be shooting for. So why do it? Why do pal care? Well, we actually have a fair amount of evidence now that it supports better quality of life for patients and families and better healthcare utilization. And we have over 15 RCTs now. This is still one of the main RCTs, so it's the one that I'll highlight. It's Jennifer Temmel's trial that came out in um, August of 2010 in the New England Journal. So this was 151 patients newly diagnosed with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer who were randomized to full curative care or full curative care with proactive palliative care. And then they followed them. Um, their primary outcomes were at 12 weeks after enrollment. And this is what they saw. So in the group enrolled to concurrent curative care and proactive palliative care, improved quality of life, improved anxiety and depression symptoms. So the pink is the group in pal care, the blue is the um, standard care group. And if you look at PHQ-9, which is a measure of depression, the number needed to treat for that is three, three. So three patients who if you treated them with early palliative care as well as their concurrent um, chemotherapy or whatever was being used. Um, three, one of them who would have been depressed by this measure who wasn't because of that um, treatment with pal care, which is a very small number needed to treat. And then this is the first time we saw this next thing, which is why Jennifer Temmel was on NPR and a lot of the news media and such. And that's because the group randomized to the early palliative care group actually lived longer, statistically significantly for the first time in this study three months, you know, and, and folks say, well, maybe it's just one study. Well, we now have 10 RCTs that have looked at survival, and the point estimate, four of them, no change. Six of them, the point estimate is actually longer. The pal care confirmed a survival benefit, and it's statistically significant in three of the studies. Now, I'm not saying, oh, we should do pal care because that's going to make people live longer. I was um, looking for funding for one of my trials, and I called PANCAN, the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, because I do a lot of research in pancreatic cancer populations. And the program officer said, so tell me about that survival benefit with pal care. And I said, you know, if you're going to fund me on a survival benefit, I don't think we're going to have a future <laughs> that much. You know, it, 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 it may be there, but I mean, we're not talking three years. We're not talking new immunotherapy or something. You know, but the thing that it is, is folks say, well, I don't want to do pal care because it's going to make them die sooner. That's not actually not evidence-based, you know. With the trials that we have, people live as long, if not longer. So, so talked about some of the survival benefit in some of the studies, but really this is why to do it. Look at this patient experience. This is 15 RCTs that we have um, in diverse populations, although a lot of what we've done still has been in medical oncologic populations. But patient experience, caregiver experience, improved in all but one of the trials. And in the one, it wasn't changed. Everything else improved quality of life, improved symptom management, improved caregiver burden among uh, the family members. And you know what? It also happens to cost less in a lot of trials. So one of my colleagues, I think, describes this well, where he says palliative care is better care at a cost we can afford, and that it costs less. And I get folks who say, well, you know, what about hope? I, I, I don't want to take hope away. I feel like we talk about these issues, we're going to take hope away. Well, you know, this has actually been studied. So HEARTH Hope Index is a validated measure for patient hope. And they did a before and after study of patients who were going for their third line of chemotherapy. And there was going to be a palliative care discussion of, I'm sorry, I wish things were different, but this third line is not going to help you. You know, your disease has progressed, it's advanced. You know, when we think that, that nasty pal care discussion, maybe it's truth telling and such. No change afterwards. Actually, it went up a little bit. When they did qualitative afterwards, family member or patients said, you know, I expected this. It's just good to know because it helps me plan. Now, when you look at, say, advanced care planning, which is where we have some other data for, there's about 10% of the population who freak out at these conversations, you know. There's about 10% very proactive, want everything up to the end. I want to die in the ICU with chemo going in my veins and such. You know, there's about 20% who are pretty proactive of 
line in the sand about quality of life for me, this is what's important. And then that 70% in the middle, that's usually who we're acting on. Those are the folks who aren't, they actually have a line in the sand, there's things they care about. When we study them, that 10% of active folks doesn't get bigger. That 70%, they have a line in the sand, they're just not as activated about it. And so they need people to talk to them about it, to figure out what it is for them. So there will still be some people who freak out when you have these conversations because they're part of that 10%. And one of the classic things in early pal care fellows is goes, this patient kind of threw me out of the room. And it's like, yeah, you talk to one of the 10%. But 90% of the time, folks are gonna wanna talk about something related to this, especially when you come at it in a educated kind of palliative care communication trained way. So this is the data on hope. And now proactive palliative care is part of ASCO guidelines. So this came out in October of 2016. So they're recommending referral of patients to interdisciplinary palliative care teams is optimal um, for patients with advanced illness, advanced cancer. So what's been done in the surgical world, which I'm gonna hit upon only briefly. Um, thank you, Arden, for having me come to Espires, which I talked a few weeks ago about the um, surgical world and kind of cultural and pragmatic barriers to palliative care. Um, so I'm not gonna touch upon them here, but I do wanna hit upon Zara Cooper's beautiful systematic review that came out in JAMA Surgery um, a little over two years ago. So there's actually been 25 articles of 22 unique interventions related to palliative care in the surgical world. And you could say like, oh gosh, look, there's a lot there. Actually. They're not. Of these 25 studies, only four are of moderate quality, 18 are low quality, three are very low quality studies, like, like less than 20 people and such. So I care a lot about preoperative advanced care planning. So let's say what studies did preoperative advanced care planning? Only four, you know? And the one of them that actually is of moderate quality, quality is Grimaldo et al, which um, was done almost 20 years ago. So not, not that new. So how about consultant pal care? Consultants and palliative care specialists seeing surgical patients. There have been eight trials, but the majority of them are post-op and in surgical ICUs. So this is the one that four only that are pre-operative consultant palliative care being involved. Four studies, two very low quality, less than 10 patients in one, 18 in the other. Um, one low quality and one moderate quality. The moderate quality one is Ernst et al. that came out of Jason Johanning's group of the VA. And it was an intervention that was about frailty screening. So folks were screened and if they screened frail, they got proactive bundle. The bundle was things like prehab and nutritional support. And they got pal care too, maybe but they don't even know which patients got pal care. So, you know, it's an intriguing study because it actually conferred a survival benefit across one month, three months, and six months, uh, or no, 12 months post-op, even when they controlled for um, whether or not people had surgery and their frailty and a bunch of comorbidities. Um, but it's still, we're not even sure which patients got pal care. So there's not been a lot done in surgery for variety of cultural and pragmatic reasons. And so this is what I walked into. I'm gonna kind of breeze through some of my early research, um, although it's a foundation of which everything came from. So um, I first started off and said, okay, I'm really interested in communication regarding prognosis. Let's have a cross-sectional survey. If everybody agrees we're doing it well, then maybe we are doing it well. If there's some dissonance, then maybe there's room for improvement. We found dissonance <laughs> you know, when we asked surgical ICU nurses, surgeons, ICU intensivists, and nurse practitioners, people felt very differently about how well we communicated prognosis. So we said, you know, there might be room for improvement. So we did uh, focus groups with surgical intensive care users, nurses saying specifically, what are the barriers to optimal communication regarding prognosis? And in this study, we also said, what are the barriers to optimal end of life care for people actually dying in our ICUs? And so we had these barriers to communication and we said, okay, you know, let's do something about it. I'm a trialist, I'm an interventionist in my heart. Like, let's make this better, let's iterate. So rather than make it a new wheel, let's take a wheel off the shelf, what's been done in other ICUs and let's operationalize what's been successful in other places. So we found an intervention that came out of the Brigham, it was Craig Lilly's group, um, which looked great. Now it decreased ICU length of stay, that's all nice and dandy, but the big thing is it decreased um, a disagreement between patients and family, I'm sorry, between family member patients and ICU clinicians and between different ICU clinician teams. That disagreement, it took it way, way, way down. So we said, great, that, that sounds like just what we're talking about. Spent two years operationalizing it in a transferring it over, bringing it into a surgical ICU and operationalizing it. And we did a six month pilot. And it really, 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 really didn't work. <laughs> 
What worked great in a closed model medical ICU did not work in a semi-open administrative model ICU. So, you know, this is part of my PhD dissertation. You know, you kind of look and say, gosh, well, maybe the surgical world's a little different. And so I got funding from the Foundation for Anesthesia Education and Research, and we did a two-year qualitative study where we just interviewed surgical ICU patients. Many of them were too sick to talk to us. Um, but if we talked to their family, up to three family members per person. We talked to their surgeons, we talked to their nurses, they talked to their intensivists, and we followed up with patients and families at six months and 12 months. And I could do a whole talk right now about the different things we heard, but I really want to bring out this one point that has been a crux upon which a lot of my work has uh, sat since then. Because we heard this again and again and again. So this is a patient who had a pancreatic tumor, had it resected, unfortunately had a significant perioperative neurologic complication and ended up in the ICU for about three weeks. And this is about a week and a half into the ICU stay. We chose XY Hospital because we think it's the business, her husband. Um, we think it's the best. I think they've done everything they can, and basically what they're saying now is that they've done everything. I brought in a woman who was vital, and now she can't speak. It took nine hours. They took half her insides out, and now she's completely dependent, can't do anything anymore. She can't communicate. Of all the things we expected, this was not one of them. They went down all the list of all the problems you could have. We didn't think this was on the list. We heard this again and again and again from family members, and it really came clear in our minds that this was kind of the mindset people were coming in with. The idea that, okay, my loved one's either going to do well, and yeah, they may be sick for a while, but they're going to go to the ICU, and they'll get a little better, and, and then, you know, maybe rehab, and, but they'll be getting better, better. And if it's a bad outcome, they're going to die on the operating room table. And I think we all know, unless you're talking about ruptured aortic aneurysms or trauma, very few people die on the operating room table. You know, if they die, it's in the days to weeks to months afterwards where they just don't seem to get back on the horse again after their surgery. You know, but family don't understand this. So their loved one gets out of the OR and they think, oh, fabulous, oh, bad gone, they're on the good track. But then they're not really. They don't really keep getting better. You know, and so families are confused, patients are confused. So really, we said, gosh, of all the things we expected, this is not one of them. How do we help people have some conversations before the ICU, not so much to expect this, but to be better ready for it if it happens? Well, conversations about what you want in the future if you can't make decisions for yourself. That's advanced care planning. So maybe we need to do some more advanced care planning before they hit the ICU. And if that means it's before they hit the surgical ICU, that means it's before the surgery. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to go into pre-op clinics? Okay, well, so this really divided my work, and I always have work now that is going on in ICUs to improve the palliative care for people that are actually there, as well as work of trying to help to do better advanced care planning before people actually hit those ICUs. So we said, we're going to do advanced care planning and surgery. This is like 2011, 2012. People thought we were kind of crazy because uh, Gretchen Schwarzy, who does wonderful work, she's a vascular surgeon and ethicist at the University of Wisconsin. Look at her work. She does really superb work. She had just come out in, I think it was in, it was certainly in critical care medicine as well as I think it was Journal of the American College of Surgeons, a cross-sectional survey that um, had said, you know, if a patient comes in with pre-existing advanced care planning wishes, do you offer surgery? And a high proportion of surgeons said, no, I won't offer surgery. And so that was the article, the thing is called surgical buy-in. And so folks were then saying, well, we maybe shouldn't be doing advanced care planning and surgery. These patients won't get surgery then. And we came in and said, we're going to do advanced care planning and surgery. So, so there was conflict somewhat at the time. And um, folks kind of thought maybe we were a little crazy. But I got to say, we were rooted in two years of qualitative work. And we just felt right in our heart that this is what we were hearing from patients and family members. And we thought it was the right thing to do and to follow through on it. So we went to the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, which was kind of a baby at the time. It was their second round of funding. We said we want to develop and test a patient and family-centered advanced care planning instrument for uh, people preparing for it. This, we said first major pancreatic cancer surgery. And we said instrument, those four advanced care pl planning studies I showed you were all conversation-based, so training somebody to have a conversation about advanced care planning. We were really interested in instrument-based things for two reasons, so instruments, video, booklets, web-based modules. Um, we liked this for two things. First off, um, the surgeons we worked with were much more excited about it. They said, you know, I like that I've seen the video, I know what my patient is going to have seen, and I know what framing they're going to use when they come in and we talk about these issues. Um, and they were not excited about training somebody else to have these conversations. Um, 
And then also, too, instruments are way easier to disseminate. You know, you go to a funder and say, I want to make a video, and then I'll disseminate it. That's way easier than saying, I want to develop a communication training program and train 5,000 people to do it and change the world with that. So instruments are, are more disseminatable as well. So we're a real diverse team to do work like this. You have to have a diverse team. Uh, patients, family members, surgeons, intensivists, anesthesiologists, palliative care providers, and they funded us. So um, we started off very humble with this, and we said, well, what's out there for perioperative advanced care planning? What's been done? So we did an environmental scan with the idea that there's written data sources, verbal data sources, so verbal, the stuff where folks say, you know, you can't read this anywhere, but this is what I do, and this is good. And there's professional perspectives and lay perspectives, and we hit all four of these. So we did a broad systematic review of perioperative advanced care planning instruments. We found nothing <laughs> had been tested in the surgical world, but we did find 39 instruments that had been tested in populations such as ambulatory older adults with diseases such as cancer or COPD. That's not too different. So we thought, you know, we could probably use stuff from here. We did an extensive gray lit search. We had somebody with a month and an abstraction tool looking at all of these different websites and pulling off anything related to advanced care planning. We also looked at newspaper articles, ongoing trials, PhD dissertations, YouTube. We should have a lot on YouTube. I'm going to come back to that. We did in-depth interviews with experts. We did it with surgeons who loved advanced care planning, surgeons who really didn't think that much of advanced care planning, advanced care planning experts, patient and family advocacy group leaders. You know, we're going to build, we want to build something for the surgical world. What should it look like? And we took everything back to stakeholder summits with patients, where we would get patients, family members, surgeons, palliative care experts, advanced care planning folks all around a table and say, this is what we found. Tell us what you think. Play with it. And um, we used a lot of design thinking. You can see those little pieces of paper. It's always the idea of getting what's in people's brains, out of their brains, onto boards, and us talking about it and prioritizing some of those thoughts. And we listened really hard. These are the things that we were hearing when folks were processing what we found in the systematic, and gray, uh, systematic review and gray literature search. They liked content as far as vignettes, real stories, less about death and dying, more about how you want to live. They needed to be specific to surgical populations. What was built for an Alzheimer's disease population does not work for a surgical population. And then upbeat, involving younger and older subjects, multiple ethnicities. We always said we could make a really awful or it would be a really good, awful advanced care planning video, because we saw so many. It would be like this empty room with dim light, a bed that's made but empty and panning out the window, and there's an empty canoe going off into the sunset with flickering light and plaintive music, and, and then a talking head coming on going, you need to do advanced care planning. <laughs> we saw it all. There's a lot out there. Um, the, folks, the stuff folks really liked is what we found on YouTube. So we went back to YouTube and we did essentially a systematic review. So we found over 23,000 hits related to advanced care planning. There were, over nine, there were nine videos with over 1,000 views. We had to eliminate the death panels in Obamacare as Satan videos because, you know, they're, they're out there. <laughs> we found 42 videos with relevant content. And I mean, we really did try to treat it like a systematic review. We went with an abstraction tool, seeing what was in the videos, who was talking. Was it from the patient perspective, from the provider perspective? And there's just a lot out there, you know? We found stuff from CBS, from Duke Medicine, from JAMA. We found stuff from Tom DeLowry. I don't know who he is, but he made a video and people looked at it, you know? <laughs> and we took the ones that, that had a lot of views and we took some of the tropes back yet again to our stakeholder summits and said, what, what do you like? Help us to do this. And that really helped us to get a look and a feel for what the video should be like. And then we have to have a storyline, so we actually went about it in a, the same approach that you would use to do product development. So we had a conceptual model where we started with what we got from the environmental scan and iterated. Um, but you've got to have um, something you can work on. So we actually worked into storyboards. And we iterated with storyboards. Um, we considered this kind of, so advanced, if this is a phase one drug trial, advanced care planning is the drug. We now have to take these storyboards and this content and show it and get dose for, <laughs> dosing and, and what's safe and such in a population of essentially healthy volunteers. Well, you know, we could ask a bunch of people to the hospital and see if that's going to be a biased population. I don't know. Where are there a lot of people? So um, we went to the Maryland State Fair. It's actually like a million people that go there, you know? We rented a booth, and we were in air-conditioned, and let me tell you, air-conditioned in Baltimore in like July, August is a great place to be. And um, 
Folks looked at our storyboards, folks who self-identified as having had surgery or having a loved one who'd had surgery, and they actually are doing a prioritization task down here for a conjoint analysis to help us choose outcomes. And um, we had 359 folks stop by our booth. Um, an average of nine minutes they'd spend with us. Um, and we said to kind of, you know, here's our storyboards, here's our storyline. Are you comfortable with it? Do you find it helpful? Would you recommend it to others? And overwhelmingly, they did. They helped us with some details and stuff, too. And they actually, they helped us with our outcomes. You know, one of the main outcomes for our clinical trial came out of that interaction. So now we got to make the video. So we collaborated with Angela Vlandis, who without question is an international leader in video-based advanced care planning, though he hadn't done anything in the surgical world before. We filmed interviews with patients, family members, surgeons, surgical nurses, anesthesia providers. We brought everything back to the stakeholder summit to help people choose us which ones should be in the video. Also, too, it broadened the conclusion. They broadened our uh, criteria for the clinical trials. We had started as a pancreatic cancer study and broadened it to anybody having um, major cancer surgery such that they were in the ICU afterwards. Uh, editing took 10 months. We had 14 different versions of the video. We showed it to 70 different stakeholders, you know, surgeons, patient and family members, patient family advisory council and such. And here's our video. I'm not going to show the whole thing. It's six minutes long, but I'm going to show you the start and the beginning and the middle, the advanced care planning in the middle and the end. Hello, my name is Theodora and this is my sister Carolyn. She had surgery last year. A video for patients and their loved ones. Hi, my name is Judy, and my son had serious surgery. Hi, I'm Matt Weiss. I'm a surgeon. Hi, my name is Rhonda. I've been an ICU nurse for 18 years. I'm Rebecca Oslickson. I'm a doctor who performs anesthesia. My name is Carolyn, and I had major surgery. Hi, I'm Marty McCary, and I'm a surgeon. Getting ready for major surgery. Advice from patients, family members, nurses, and doctors. Um, the surgery was my only shot at uh, going into remission or being cured. And I knew I had to take this window of opportunity because my health was really good at the time. My sister and I talked about the surgery, um, but she made the final decision. And, uh, but we were, both, we were both afraid. It's normal for people to feel scared before surgery. It's not something we plan for in regular daily life. Okay, we show the pre-op area. We show the OR. Oh, we're going to go to the ICU afterwards. And this is getting There's to the advanced care planning. Patients don't even remember their time in the intensive care unit. In the ICU, uh, my sister Carolyn was very, very sick, and she was heavily medicated and could not communicate for a couple of days. In the operating room and the ICU, I do not remember. I was hallucinating. I just don't remember. Before you have surgery, clarify who makes decisions for you. Even when the president goes under anesthesia, the vice president's ready to make any decisions that need to be made. Your surgeon and surgical team will talk to you about the risks for your surgery. For example, this could include rare things like stroke or a long hospital or intensive care unit stay, with you even depending for a while on machines for things like breathing or feeding. Your loved one needs to be ready to speak for you in those rare circumstances. So be sure they know you. They are ready to talk about your beliefs and your goals and your values. What I wish I had known prior to surgery was just to be prepared to make sure that I had investigated all the possibilities and had conversations with my family uh, prior to the surgery happening. A little bit of planning before surgery can make a huge difference after surgery, not just for you, but for the people who care for you and the people who will be caring for you. Look at her now. Okay. Going through to the end. Boop, 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 boop. And it's very helpful. For instance, paying your bill. Oh, hello. My name ah! is Theodora. And this Hi, Theodora. <laughs> okay. I should go up to Marty here. Right. So speak up for yourself or speak up for a loved one on their behalf. Before surgery, talk with your family and friends. Let them know who makes decisions for you and then have a conversation with that person. They need to be ready to speak for you. What are your goals? What are your beliefs? What are your values? What are the treatments that you want? Are there treatments that you really don't want? 
then continue the conversation with your surgeon and surgical team. These conversations are so important. They're the way that we show we love each other. Love depicts who we are, and my mother taught us how to love one another, and we take care of one another. We want to take care of you, too. Before surgery, identify the person who speaks for you. Talk with that person. If issues should arise, that person needs to be ready to speak for you. Tell your surgeon and surgical team who will speak for you. Two years, lots of work. Here's the video. So now it's time for clinical trial. We've got our video, we've got our drug, our advanced care planning. How does it work in people who actually have the illness, people who are going for surgery? So we did a clinical trial among nine surgeons, surgical oncologists, for patients who are having major cancer surgery. They would see their surgeon. The surgeon would say, I think we're going to have surgery. We would then enroll them in the trial. They would get randomized at that point to be video, our video. This is PCORI. We have to do comparative effectiveness. So people in the control arm saw a video, but it was a video that was informational about the hospital and the surgical program. No advanced care planning in it. They got web links so that they could go home and access the video afterwards if they wanted to watch it with family members and such, and then they came back to the preoperative anesthesia testing center to get their testing before surgery, and on that day they met with their surgeon and they talked about the risks and benefits and signed surgical consent. We audio recorded that conversation. That, based on the input we had from the state fair, that was our primary outcome. What was talked about in that conversation? Do people talk about advanced care planning, their goals and their wishes? Our hypothesis was that the video was going to activate patients and families such that Goals would be talked about more, advanced care planning would be talked about more, and that it would be more patient and family centered because they would be activated, which has been shown in lots of other studies, but mostly in outpatient settings. And um, then they went and had their surgery. We saw them a week after surgery and a month after surgery. So we did the clinical trial. We had 92 people enrolled, uh, 45 to the intervention arm, 47 to the control arm. Let me just start off. We had nobody who dropped out of the trial because they saw our video with advanced care planning, freaked out, and said, I can't do this. Like, we had no harms associated with this, which already was kind of unexpected for people back in 2012 when we first proposed this, who said, you can't do advanced care planning before surgery. People are going to get freaked out. You know, so we had no negative outcomes with that. Um, uh, we still ended up mostly being a pancreatic cancer study because we started that way. <laughs> we started as an HPV study, but um, we also certainly enrolled patients with sarcoma as well as gynecologic cancer. So we actually had more women than men in the study because of including the, the gyne population. So what were our outcomes? What did we find? So we auto recorded those conversations. And we didn't see a big change. So did you talk about a medical decision maker? And you saw, that was like the purpose of our video. Who makes decisions for you if you can't for yourself? In the control arm, it only came up 10% of the conversations. You know, 23% in the intervention arm, but those numbers are small. So our p-value was like 0.08. So it's a trend, but it wasn't statistically significant. You know, and, and not a lot of differences. So goals, yet again, not that different between the group uh, groups. What else did we find in secondary outcomes? So we looked at anxiety and depression scores. So people had surgery here, and you can see there's a bump. That, that bump is one week after surgery. It was not a difference between the two intervention arms, but it was markedly different from enrollment. So people get, and it actually came out of depression. People were much more likely to feel depressed after surgery. We also asked people using the Iowa Goals of Care, why are you getting surgery, why you're doing it, and very much people were on the cure train, which I would be too. I had pancreatic cancer, I was going for surgery, I would get surgery because I want it to cure my medical condition, allow me to live longer and improve my current health. You know, I get it. But the other ones, certainly learning more about my disease or helping me feel better, quite low. So folks were on the cure train. People did find our video more helpful. They, they, they thought our video was useful. You know, so that's nice. So what were our conclusions? So we successfully integrated an advanced care planning video into a surgical population without any harms. You know, that's, and it was thought helpful. That's pretty awesome. You know, our dose of advanced care planning maybe needs to be stronger. We know more now than we did then that actually advanced care planning, like telling people about smoking cessation and such, you, you actually have to do it over multiple times. People don't just get one time and go, oh, why haven't I done this? I'm going to do it now. Like, they sometimes have to hear it kind of multiple times. And also, too, really interesting, out of the medical oncologic literature, literature um, they did a study saying, who do you want to talk about with this? About half the patients said, yeah, with my oncologist. And about half said, well, not with anybody but my oncologist. 
<laughs> they really want to, some of them, a sizable proportion, want to have these conversations with somebody who is not their oncologist. And I wouldn't be surprised, it's not been studied, if people might feel that way about their surgeon too. I don't know. You know. Uh, then also too, we saw this bump in mood symptoms, um, uh, uh, which could be a, a si signal for possible future interventions. And folks were really focused on cure and extending life, which I get. But we aren't sure what's their understanding of it and how much do they want to know about it before. Because we know this patient population, we've studied them. This was at Johns Hopkins, John Cameron, 2,000 Whipples consecutive that he's done. We have that data. You know, for folks who are getting a Whipple for pancreatic adenocarcinoma, median survival is 18 to 20 months. You know, I mean, they're definitely one out of five who live long. They live longer than three years. If I'm on that OR table, I want to be that one out of five. That's why I'm there. You know, but four out of five, Something happens in those four years, vast majority, it's the cancer coming back. You know, how much do people want to know about that? Because actually we've got data that people don't know it. You know, so the CANCOR study, um, which was in patients with lung cancer and colon cancer, Weeks et al., New England Journal of Medicine, October 2012, they asked those folks, why are you getting chemotherapy? For folks with stage three and four cancer, they said, well, I'm getting it for cure. About 70% did. You know, when you have stage three and four lung cancer, you're not getting chemotherapy for cure. You know, so there's a big separation. And Tim Pollack, who used to be at Hopkins, now at OSU, is chair of surgery there. He looked at that same data set and surgery. Folks who were getting surgery for stage four lung cancer and stage four colon cancer, why are you getting surgery? And it was like 60 some percent said they thought it was for cure. So if I'm getting it, I'm gonna hope for a cure too, but there's, there's, there's dissonance there. So how much do people actually wanna know? So we said, well, what if, what if it was consultant pal care folks who did the advanced care planning and maybe did some pal care too. What if we did that? And so we took that to PCORI and we were funded again last year to compare surgeon alone versus surgeon palliative care team co-management for patients undergoing surgery for upper GI cancers. Yet again, a diverse team. You can't do this work alone. And we were awarded a contract that started funding in April. So we are gearing all up and getting ready to go. We're hoping to enroll our first patients this month. So it's the PERIOP PC study. The three study sites are Johns Hopkins, the Dana-Farber in Boston, uh, the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, and then now that I'm here at Stanford, we're the coordinating center, and Arden's been involved in this trial, as has Allison. Thank you for your help with it. Um, and we are hoping yet again to enroll our first patients this month. We're certainly geared up and ready to go. Serena Bidwell, I don't know if she's here. She helped with our, ah, Serena. Thank you. She's helped with our database. Um, since I've got here only in March, though, I've also started working with Kristen Stoudemire and Mary Locks, starting to say, how do we maybe approach geriatric head trauma patients differently? How do we maybe optimize some communication and discussions with them, particularly as they come in? Because the system was built for a 20-year-old who has a head injury after a car accident. That's very different than an 85-year-old who has a head injury, which is a, a fall from standing and is correlated with progressive frailty. We shouldn't be treating these patients in the same way. So how do we maybe think about our geriatric patients in a different way? It's so kind of in closing, an academic research career. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not a straight line. If you had told me, you know, six years ago that I was going to, well, actually, more like seven, eight years ago, that I was going to be doing a lot of my research in preoperative surgical clinics and I was going to have a study at the Maryland State Fair, I, I thought, probably would have thought you were crazy. Um, it says, warning, fasten bra straps and remove dentures, very bumpy road. <laughs> you know, things do not go as you plan. <laughs> no. You know, we rolled out that ICU-based palliative care communication study in the surgical ICU thinking we were awesome. We were going to make the world a better place, and it really, really didn't work. <laughs> you know? um, we had many hiccups in the video study. Like, I got on one point on a call that I thought was just a friendly check-in call, and it was a conference call with 14 lawyers you know, that were employed by the hospital, and that was a week before we were to start filming. You age very quickly in a phone call with 14 lawyers. <laughs> um, you know, but it's really fun to do this work, and it's really fun to maybe get people together that folks don't think actually go together. Some folks go, is that, is that the surgeon coming to do research work with you? I'm like, no, 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 no. That's the palliative care doc between the two ICU nurses getting brought to the back of the ICU to visit the ECMO patient. <laughs> no. um. Of course, you can't do any of this work alone. I have amazing people that I've worked with. I had just an absolutely fabulous team in Baltimore, and, and I look forward to building a really great team here, too, in, in California. And um, yet again, very diverse patients, family members, surgeons. I have to really give big kudos to, to Matt Weiss, who's a HPB surgeon at Hopkins, who's done work with me now for about six years. And 
he's just wonderful. And Fabian Johnston, who did work, um, we did work when he was a fellow at Hopkins, now he's an attending, and um, he's just, he's awesome. He does just fabulous, fabulous work. Um, and that's it. So I welcome any other questions, and, um, and I look forward to meeting, if I haven't met you before, I look forward to meeting you, and I look forward to hopefully collaborating with you on projects. If you have ideas that you're thinking about doing that relates to communication and family coping and stuff, please reach out to me, because I really enjoy collaborating and working. So thank you.